Greetings, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Cheryl Jennison DeProza, and today I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Tim Veer. And Tim is going to be talking through talking us through the smart digital wireless technologies that we have on offer here at Sure. But before we get into that, just a few items of housekeeping. First of all, as you may be aware, we are not broadcasting from our usual controlled environments. Um, because of the current pandemic situation, most Sure associates are working from home. So Tim and I are both broadcasting to you from our homes. Um, And the reason I bring that up is just to let you know if we do run into any sort of audio or connectivity issues to just please play, please be patient and bear with us. Um, We want to get through them and get this information out to you. Second of all, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing. Um, It takes us about a week to get it uh, edited and ready for public consumption, but once it is ready, you will be able to find it at sure.com slash webinars. And I'll repeat that. That is sure.com slash webinars. It's a great place to go and visit. We have all of our upcoming sessions listed there that you can register for. And then we also have all of our past archived webinars available there for on-demand viewing. So go to sure.com slash webinars and check out all of our great past webinars. It's a lot of great information across a lot of different audio topics there. And then last of all, as we go through the session today, if you have any questions, please feel free to type those into the question pane. If you don't see the question pane and you have logged in through the web app, just look for that question mark icon and click on that to access the question section. Or if you are logged in through the actual GoToWebinar uh, desktop app, look for a dark gray toolbar with an orange box with a white arrow on it and click on that orange box uh, to get access to the question pane. Type in those questions, but please be patient because we will be holding on those until the end of the session. All right, that wraps up all the boring stuff. Let's get into the good stuff. Take it away, Tim. Uh, Good morning, all, or whatever time of the day it is in your time zone. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about various smart technologies that are incorporated into Sure wireless systems, specifically the digital wireless systems. And I should note at the outset that uh, some of these smarts are on the radio side of things. Some of them are on the audio side of things, and some are on the kind of equipment management side of things. So we'll look at all of those uh, intelligences that uh, we've built into the products. We're going to look at uh, Sure Wireless Systems that are operating in the UHF band, uh, in what's called the DECT band, around 1.9 gigahertz, and also uh, the uh, 2.4 gigahertz band. And we have products in all of those things. So we're hoping that... Going over these things will give uh, audio engineering types uh, and AV designers a little bit uh, deeper understanding of how some of these products work, uh, and that should help you to uh, configure them and choose them for uh, specific applications. Um, Let me go to uh, this slide, and uh, we'll first of all kind of offer a few common features that are found in all of these uh, digital systems. Uh, These are all uh, 24-bit digital audio uh, schemes. Uh, So the uh, audio fidelity is quite good. Uh, Frequency response uh, easily uh, up to 20K, wide dynamic range, uh, typically uh, well above 100 dB. Um, Easy pairing of transmitters and receivers through uh, various methods, either infrared sync or uh, network Uh, syncing. And all of these systems have some uh, version of encryption, that is, some ability to uh, uh, protect the transmitted information from unintended uh, uh, receivers. Uh, Most of them, uh, QLXD, ULXD, uh, MXW, and Axiom Digital use uh, an AES-256 encryption scheme, which is generally regarded as a a very uh, robust uh, encryption scheme. GLXD doesn't use a specific encryption method, but because of its uh, frequency hopping uh, implementation, uh, it would be a difficult system to to receive in an unauthorized fashion. Uh, These systems also include uh, various power management techniques. Uh, Most of them have capability of uh, rechargeable batteries. All of these systems we offer uh, lithium ion rechargeable battery options for. They can be charged in the transmitters or in some cases the batteries can be removed and put into separate uh, charging trays. And all of these systems 
the ULXD, QLXD, Axiom Digital, uh, metal hardware construction uh, on the uh, receivers and transmitters, uh, particularly the uh, GLXD Advanced, and it's all uh, rack mountable uh, equipment that can be configured in, in multiples to scale these systems up uh, significantly. Uh, ultimately, we've put together what we feel is a, a set of systems that are easy to configure uh, and offer a high level of durability and uh, reliability and great uh, sound quality. Uh, we would expect, and, and we actually measure that the frequency response uh, and the dynamic range of these digital systems is uh, noticeably better than even our best analog systems in the past. And due to the nature of the digital transmission scheme, the audio quality is not directly affected by the quality of the RF link. And we'll see some places where this uh, shows up. Um, but let's uh, take a look at a couple of uh, smart technologies that are unique to these digital systems, and that is uh, encryption uh, and something we call gain ranging. Um, the uh, classic analog UHF systems uh, did not really have a way to uh, protect against uh, demodulation or reception of those uh, signals by anyone who had a, an FM receiver. Uh, there might be some audio anomalies due to the way we handle uh, compounding and pre-emphasis and de-emphasis in those systems. But uh, anybody with a, an FM receiver that could tune into those uh, transmitters could easily uh, pick up a usable audio signal from those things. Uh, so we have uh, been able to implement uh, some forms of uh, encryption uh, and other signal security into our digital systems that uh, prevents unintended receivers from picking up these uh, signals and uh, demodulating them. Uh, this has become a more popular uh, and even uh, required feature uh, by uh, many uh, users of wireless systems these days. Uh, in various government, military applications, and even uh, performance applications where people are interested in preventing unauthorized recording of, uh, of performances and so forth. Um, and again, most of the encryption schemes that we use are uh, variations of uh, AES-256 uh, encryption. The general scheme of that encryption method is to have an encryption key, which is uh, sent from the transmit to the receive source uh, so that the receiver can only uh, decode uh, signals from a particular transmitter that it's uh, uh, linked to. Uh, and the transmitter can only uh, send demodulation uh, uh, or signals that can be demodulated to a specific receiver that it is linked to. So it's a, a two-way uh, function. It's uh, a bit-by-bit -bit encryption, and the scheme adds uh, very little uh, latency to the overall uh, latency of these uh, systems. Uh, in fact, uh, when you activate or deactivate encryption in uh, our wireless systems, uh, generally it has no effect on the measured latency through the, uh, through the system. Uh, in the case of uh, QLXD, ULXD, and Axiant digital systems, uh, every time a uh, transmitter is uh, synced to a receiver channel, a new encryption key is generated. Uh, and in some cases, uh, it is possible to uh, have multiple transmitters linked to a specific uh, receiver channel. Uh, but only those transmitters that have the encryption key can be recognized uh, by that receiver channel. Uh, in the uh, Microflex wireless system, the DEC-based system, uh, the key is generated each time uh, 
a microphone is linked to a specific access point, and that key is refreshed uh, whenever the transmitter is removed from its charging dock. Uh, so uh, this makes the uh, encryption uh, more or less continuous. Uh, and in most cases, uh, the uh, user doesn't even notice uh, any effect of that. You can deactivate it on some systems, but uh, MXW, it's uh, active all the time. Now, G GLXD doesn't use an AES-256 scheme, but it does use a proprietary uh, frequency hopping transmission scheme, which provides a, a form of security in the sense that a receiver uh, tuned to a specific frequency could not uh, pick up the entire transmission from a D GLXD system. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail uh, when we get to GLXD. The other technology which is new uh, and unique to our digital systems uh, compared to uh, our previous analog systems is something we call gain ranging technology. One of the uh, difficulties uh, of setup for um, traditional analog FM uh, wireless systems was uh, that in order to maintain good um, signal to noise ratio and uh, dynamic range, one had to uh, ensure that you had uh, kind of maximum modulation of the uh, FM signal. Uh, if the signal was not well modulated, uh, it would be noisy, uh, but if it was over modulated, you'd get distortion. So all transmitters from those analog systems typically had some sort of an audio input gain adjustment to kind of set that. And that uh, uh, analog uh, gain adjustment is sort of the equivalent of the, the head amp uh, on a mixer, the, the preamp, uh, uh, where you, you need to set that level fairly accurately so you don't run out of headroom on a loud signal, but on a, on a softer signal, you don't uh, drop down into the noise floor. This, uh, is a somewhat difficult adjustment or has been and was the source of some confusion and uh, less than optimal uh, system uh, utilization if it wasn't done properly. Uh, I'll note as a side light that in the Axiant analog series, uh, the gain adjustment was refined a little bit from uh, its predecessor to have a single uh, gain adjustment point that not only gave a, a 1 dB stepwise gain, but also switched in uh, attenuators at the appropriate points in that gain setup so that you always had a kind of an optimal uh, signal to noise ratio, whatever the gain setting was. But even that was not uh, the easiest thing to do. And of course, you'd have to do it at the transmitter. Uh, and once the transmitter is in the hands of the uh, performer, uh, you don't have access to that adjustment if it wasn't done properly initially, difficult to uh, fix after the fact. Uh, so in these gain ranging systems that are used in all of our digital series now, uh, the incoming audio signal from the microphone goes to a little buffer amp and it splits to two different gain amplifier pathways. Uh, ultimately, there's a there's an analog to digital converter in here, which is a two channel device. So we've got a low gain uh, amplifier path and a high gain uh, amplifier path. Uh, the, the ultimate signal to noise ratio through these systems can be over 120 dB, uh, even more if you go fully digital. Uh, but uh, what uh, effectively happens here is that the signal is going through both of these gain paths uh, the low gain amp uh, will be uh, a little bit noisier, but has a higher uh, clip point, a higher uh, level of headroom. The high gain side is quieter. It's a you know, preamp set to higher level, but of course, it was going to have a lower uh, amount of headroom. Uh, the signal passes through both of these amplifiers all the time. And in the DSP that's downstream of the uh, two channel A to D converter, the uh, transmitter uh, decides which bits from which bit stream uh, are transmitted on to the receiver. Uh, and so you always have uh, bits that have come through a path that has a uh, good signal to noise ratio uh, and not uh, uh, clipped. 
so the combination of this dual stage uh, A to D section uh, expands the dynamic range uh, well above uh, 120 dB, uh, more than you can get with any sort of a single stage uh, analog front end in a traditional system. Uh, what it uh, what it allows is that uh, for most signals, there is no necessity to adjust gain in these transmitters. Uh, there is still a gain control of sorts uh, on uh, the transmitters, some of them, uh, in the form of something called gain offset. Uh, the gain offset adjustment, which can be found in uh, ULXD, QLXD, uh, AD, and so forth, uh, is not actually a uh, an analog gain setting or you know preamp setting. It occurs in the digital signal path, uh, and it's not intended really to be used as a uh, input sensitivity adjustment or level adjustment, but rather a means of sort of normalizing or equalizing the level uh, between multiple transmitters that may be. Uh, linked with a particular receiver. Uh, a common application might be a, a rental system uh, which goes out with a body pack transmitter and a handheld transmitter. The body pack transmitter with a lapel microphone is typically not going to have as high an output level to the receiver because uh, the microphone is farther away from the uh, talker's mouth uh, compared to the handheld transmitter that might be in that uh, kit. And uh, if the user is not familiar with the gain differences between these things, they're going to have to be riding gain on the mixer or whatever is downstream of that because the handheld microphone is likely to be louder than the body pack microphone of the same rig. But it is possible to use the offset adjustment uh, on one transmitter or the other uh, so that the output level from either transmitter is fairly comparable at the receiver. So depending on which one you pick up, you don't have to uh, make any changes downstream to the audio levels. Another place this shows up is uh, electric guitar players. They may have three or four guitars. And depending on the pickups and designs and so forth, some guitars are much hotter than others. And they'll end up with a separate transmitter on each instrument. But all of them uh, are picked up by generally one channel of a receiver. Uh, and by using the offset adjustment, it's possible to normalize that range of uh, electric instruments, for example. So the Strat comes through at about the same level as the Les Paul, uh, and you don't have to uh, change anything downstream when you pick up a different instrument uh, in, in the rig. So that's the way the offset adjustment is uh, typically used. There are a couple of transmitters, the ULXD1 and AD1, uh, that do have uh, a 12 dB uh, analog pad at the input. Uh, and those are useful if you're going to hit those transmitters with a really, really hot signal, uh, like uh, an active electric bass or a keyboard instrument or something that might actually overload that uh, buffer amp at the beginning. Uh, so there is a, an analog 12 dB pad in those devices. Uh, but in general, uh, other than the pad adjustment, there's not much to be done on the transmitter. Uh, and gain on these systems ultimately is handled uh, at the receiver end of things. So uh, this becomes a, a useful thing as far as setup goes. All right. Uh, it is uh, worth looking at uh, the interference detection schemes that are used in these various uh, Sure systems. Uh, Interference detection is important because uh, it determines whether the system is going to squelch or mute or whether it might uh, change to a different uh, frequency or something in the uh, Axiom Digital system, for example. Um, and it's uh, a somewhat different scheme for detecting interference uh, in digital transmission than is uh, used historically in analog transmission. Uh, in analog transmission, you're looking at uh, either uh, a severe change in the RF noise floor 
uh, or a degradation in the signal to noise ratio of the uh, analog signal that's being demodulated. And you could infer that this was due to interference or some other issue, multipath, for example, and take uh, appropriate steps to uh, change frequencies or whatever. Uh, with a digital system, we're not uh, so interested in the uh, source of the, the problem because we can detect the results of that problem, whether it's interference or something else, by looking at the integrity of the bit streams that are coming into the receiver. Uh, so how do we know the integrity of these uh, bit streams? Uh, when the uh, signal is encoded in the uh, transmitter, uh, going through the uh, A to D conversion, uh, you're getting effectively a, a bit stream of some sort, which represents the audio. But uh, extra bits are added to that uh, bit stream that includes audio. There's, there's bits on there that uh, tell you uh, battery uh, level and other things. But those bits come in uh, little packets, and uh, it is possible uh, to encode some extra information along with those packets, which can be verified at the receiver end of things to ensure that that packet was received correctly. Uh, this little uh, long division in indication on the left-hand side <clears throat> basically uh, tells you how uh, the algorithm works. It's a variation of something called cyclic redundancy or CRC. And uh, this system uh, creates some extra bits for each packet that comes along. And in the receiver, uh, it performs the same division technique uh, and compares the remainder uh, to the remainder that was sent along uh, with the original packet. And if they don't match up, that set of data is bad. That's an error. Uh, and depending on the error rate, that is how frequently these errors are occurring uh, in the received signal, the receiver may take uh, appropriate action. In an extreme case, uh, it'll mute uh, because the uh, bit error rate has exceeded some uh, threshold which is set in the, in the device. So all of these digital transmission schemes incorporate some means of uh, verifying the integrity of the received signal. This uh, CRC function is uh, pretty common. And in most cases, these are able to detect a high uh, percentage of uh, transmission errors, close to 99.9% uh, .9 of uh, transmission errors. Uh, all of this has to happen uh, in real time. Uh, and it is uh, one of the parts of the digital path uh, that does add uh, a little bit of latency uh, to the transmitted signal. But uh, this is the general uh, criterion for the uh, muting or squelching of a, a digital receiver. Uh, if the bit error rate exceeds some threshold, uh, the system will mute or take other action uh, if, uh, if that's available. Um, there are a couple of differences between our uh, sort of single receiver section wireless systems like ULXD and QLXD, which have a single receiver uh, section and use an antenna switching algorithm uh, compared to Axiant Digital, which has two uh, complete receiver sections, one attached to each antenna. Uh, and each of those receiver sections is creating uh, a bit stream. The uh, single receiver section like UL, uh, ULXD creating a single bit stream and Axiom Digital benefits by being able to combine the bit streams from the multiple receive sections to further uh, provide resistance to errors that are uh, occurring on the signal coming in on either antenna. Uh, GLXD uh, has a somewhat uh, different scheme uh, which is also uh, used uh, by Microflex uh, Wireless, where you're using a, a spread spectrum technique. And in those systems, uh, muting is not usually the option, uh, but rather the system switches to uh, a different frequency. So those are a, a frequency hopping type of system. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail later on. 
uh, and we'll start with the GLXD. So GLXD operates in the 2.4 gigahertz uh, so-called ISM band, Industrial Scientific Medical. Uh, in this country, it's 2,400 uh, megahertz up to 2,483 and a half megahertz, about an 83.5 megahertz band. Uh, this has some disadvantages and some advantages. Uh, the major disadvantage is that this band is widely used for many other uh, wireless services, such as Wi-Fi, uh, Bluetooth, uh, and these are somewhat unpredictable uh, and can be quite heavy in certain uh, environments. Uh, and this can adversely affect the operation of a wireless microphone like uh, GLXD. Uh, keep in mind that most of the users of that band uh, for data transmission and so forth, don't really rely on real-time operation. Uh, when a, a Wi-Fi uh, data packet gets sent along and it gets uh, lost or corrupted, it just gets sent again. Uh, and so uh, most uh, Wi-Fi-based communication schemes have significant latency uh, because of uh, this ability to kind of retransmit things uh, and the, there's not really much reliance on, on real-time transmission. But obviously, a live wireless microphone, we want that to be as close to real-time as possible. Uh, so we have a, a higher uh, requirement for uh, stability with these real-time uh, audio signals. Uh, there are bursts of uh, Wi-Fi traffic that, that can cause unexpected issues. They can be... Uh, uh, experienced as a short short transmission range or loss of signal uh, or commonly the inability to operate more than a few uh, 2.4 gigahertz systems at a time. Uh, and we'll kind of see how it deals with that. But the advantages of 2.4 gig, which make it attractive in many places, are it's, it's an unlicensed band around the world. So you can take this gear to any country, basically. Uh, and it's not uh, a range that is used by broadcast at all. So there's no television broadcast uh, to keep track of. Uh, you can essentially scan the local environment. System uh, will set up appropriate frequencies and away you go. So the design of these systems, uh, because it's in a kind of an interference limited environment, you've got to balance the reliability of the systems uh, versus the number of simultaneous systems that you can operate. Uh, GLXD, uh, truthfully, is designed to uh, offer reliability uh, as a priority over the channel count. Uh, and this uh, limits the application of the system to some extent uh, in terms of the number of, of channels that you can put on the air at one time. So let's look at what goes on in GLXD. Uh, a thing to note on this particular slide, uh, this is uh, the sort of uh, structure of one channel of transmission. Uh, it is the case that each channel of a GLXD system uh, transmits on three different frequencies uh, constantly. That is, uh, it's not a single frequency system, uh, but over a short period of time, uh, it's using three different frequencies in a somewhat redundant fashion. It is possible uh, to have interference on one of those frequencies, uh, and there's enough information uh, still intact on the other two frequencies that the audio is not lost. Uh, and if there is interference detected on a frequency, uh, a backup frequency will be uh, engaged to take over for the frequency that was compromised. Uh, so you can think of uh, a GLXD channel as a set of six frequencies, and the system is able to use those frequencies three at a time and hop uh, between them, uh, depending on interference conditions. Uh, it's also worth knowing that uh, the receiver uh, is looking at all six frequencies all the time. 
Uh, and so if there's interference detected uh, on one frequency, it knows uh, what the best of the uh, backup frequencies might be and will automatically uh, employ that. Uh, but uh, there is no real means uh, of controlling uh, this behavior within the GLXD system. So uh, GL GLXD systems are not systems that are manually coordinated or coordinated by means of computer programs. And all of this uh, interference detection, frequency hopping, and so forth is controlled automatically uh, within the system. Um, the speed at which it can change frequencies, uh, coupled with the fact that only two frequencies have to be uh, intact at a time, means that uh, there will typically be uh, no losses of audio as it dynamically uh, changes from one frequency to another. Um, and particularly because it knows whether the new frequency is good uh, or not. Obviously, if the interference is severe enough and it can't escape by changing to different frequencies and the bit error rate gets above, again, some threshold, uh, it, will, uh, it will squelch. Uh, it's worth knowing that GLXD and, as we'll see, uh, MXW are a, are a two-way uh, system, that is, uh, like most Wi-Fi uh, range devices, uh, the two ends of that radio communication are aware of each other. They're transmitting signals back and forth. So when the receiver decides we don't have to change frequency, that message goes to the transmitter immediately. And so they both change frequency at the same time. It's a, it's a linked uh, bi-directional communication uh, established between the transmitters and receivers on these things. So, uh, and one other, I should, one other uh, difference, the GLXD standard receiver, although it has two antennas on it, is a, uh, an antenna switching receiver. It has a single receiver section uh, like uh, ULXD or QLXD, uh, but the GLXD advanced, the rack mount guy actually does have uh, two separate receive sections uh, for uh, true diversity uh, behavior. So let's look at uh, the frequency breakdown here uh, to see what's, uh, what's going on here. There are four frequency groups that the user can select from with GLXD. Of course, this information is buried in the user guide, which is rarely read, but uh, if one so chooses, uh, you'll find this information. So if you look at group number one, Group number one can handle up to four channels simultaneously. And you'll see that uh, there are six frequencies assigned to each of those channels. So at any given time, three of those frequencies are active uh, in a particular channel, and the other three are available as backups depending on the amount of interference. So channel one is always gonna be on three out of those six frequencies and channel two will always be on three out of its six frequencies and so forth. And this is generally uh, a fairly robust uh, set of frequencies uh, for up to four systems simultaneously. Note that the latency uh, in group one is about four milliseconds. Uh, and that represents the lowest latency through the GLXD system. Uh, if you want to add more simultaneous uh, frequencies, uh, you have to play some more tricks here. And so group two offers potentially up to five simultaneous systems. Again, each uh, channel gets six frequencies to choose from, and each one is using three of those at a time and hopping to the others as needed, uh, depending on interference. But to, to add that extra a bit of processing to uh, allow another system to operate. Uh, we've increased the uh, the latency of uh, the system. So group two has a latency of about 7.3 milliseconds. Let's look at uh, groups three and four. Group three is uh, the sort of maximum channel option. It potentially offers up to eight simultaneous frequencies. Again, the latency in group three is about 7.3 milliseconds. 
But as you will notice, each channel has three and only three frequencies, which means there are no backup frequencies available. Uh, so you would certainly not try to use group three if you're only running uh, five systems or less. You'd want to use group two or group one so you have some backup frequencies. But in the event that you're going to attempt to run some large number of 2.4 gigahertz wireless systems, uh, group three uh, is the way that you do this, but you would give up the ability of backup frequencies. So if any of these channels takes a hit on two frequencies at the same time, uh, you're gonna lose that channel uh, during that interference event. So this is uh, more channels, yes, but at the expense of reliability. And finally, group four uh, is the group that you choose if you're running a single GLXD system. So if you have only one GLXD system to operate, uh, it, group four is one channel and one channel only, uh, but this channel has 30 frequencies available to it. So from that uh, list of 30 frequencies, the odds are good that you can find three functional frequencies at any given time. And the system is perfectly happy to hop amongst any of those uh, 30 frequencies to find three good ones to keep you on the air. But as you can tell, the trade-off here is as you get to higher channel counts, uh, the uh, robustness of the transmission uh, decreases. Uh, the, the practical suggested limit for systems like this is maybe three or four simultaneous in a typical uh, Wi-Fi environment. And the environment is really, really bad. You may only be able to use one or two systems. All right. Uh, so what happens in, in multi-channel systems? Uh, each transmitter has to have its six frequencies. Uh, and uh, that means as you add more channels, you're, you're picking up more frequencies that have to be used. So for three systems to operate, I'm going to be using 18 frequencies total, uh, three primary for each channel and three backups for each channel. Uh, and this you know, starts to eat up a, a fair amount of spectrum. Um, a problem here is that these uh, receivers are not uh, synchronized. Uh, each receiver is unaware of the other. Uh, it doesn't know what frequencies it's using. Uh, none of the backups or, or frequencies are shared between these things, but it's not terribly efficient when you think of the fact that uh, the backup frequencies for one channel, uh, if they're not being used, eh, those backup frequencies could be used by another channel if its own backup frequencies were not good. So if there was some way to have a kind of a shared pool of backup frequencies uh, for multiple systems, this would Im improve efficiency to some extent. And there's one other uh, element here, which is the time division of these uh, transmissions. Uh, it, it is the case that uh, in a GLXD uh, transmission, there are three time slots available. Uh, and typically uh, you're on one frequency for one time slot, another frequency for a different time slot, another frequency for a different time slot, which means not only are the backup frequencies kind of uh, not efficiently used, you've got time slots on channels that are also uh, unused at uh, particular intervals. So if there was a way to not only uh, pool the backup frequencies for all systems, but also to uh, keep these time slots uh, uh, under control, we could improve the efficiency of the system. Uh, and how do we do that? Uh, this is the principle of uh, so-called GLXD Advanced. So what GLXD Advanced uh, offers uh, in the form of another piece of hardware here is a device called a frequency manager. Not the same as the spectrum manager from the Axion series, but in this case, frequency manager provides uh, antenna distribution for multiple systems, uh, but it also keeps track of 
backup frequencies for all of the connected receivers. So you, you have a pool of backup frequencies, which is a good thing. And it further uh, manages the time slots uh, for any of the uh, active uh, transmitters. Uh, this means that as I add more systems, I don't necessarily add a comparable number of backup frequencies for each channel because now I can have a, a pool of backup frequencies. And because of the three time slot uh, division, which we'll look at in a second here, uh, I can use multiple systems that actually share the same active frequencies, but in different time slots. So uh, GLXD Advanced uh, can generally handle six uh, receiver channels fairly elegantly. Uh, it would be possible to add another frequency manager and perhaps put up another five channels on that. Uh, but that would require a, a very benign uh, 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, which is not uh, common. But uh, a six system rig is, is generally pretty uh, reliable here. And just to take a, a look at the, the time slot management here, um, if we look at the uh, chart on this uh, page, the three different uh, background colors, uh, white, gray, and black, represent the three uh, transmission chunks that make up a uh, signal from one transmitter. So if you look at transmitter one, those are the white blocks. Uh, it transmits data in, in the first time slot on one frequency, transmits uh, data on the second time slot on the second frequency, and then it transmits its third uh, data block uh, in the third time slot of the third frequency. But those unoccupied time slots on those uh, three frequencies are then uh, divided up uh, amongst the other uh, two channels. So channel two uh, transmits its first block on the second frequency, its uh, second block on the third frequency, and its third block on the first frequency. So now I'm able to have three systems that are literally sharing the same three primary frequencies because each of those primary frequencies is divided into three time slots. So this makes for a much more uh, efficient setup. Uh, I'm using only three frequencies uh, for these three transmitters. And now I have a shared backup pool of frequencies which can be uh, deployed to any one of them that may pick up uh, an interference problem on any of those uh, frequencies. So this, this is the heart of the GLXD advanced system. It requires the frequency manager. It does also require the GLXD 4R, the rack mount receivers, uh, which can be managed by this thing. So uh, the only thing that's common is that the transmitters in the GLXD advanced are the same uh, transmitters that are used in the regular GLXD uh, because the transmitters are ultimately under the control of the receivers. So this is a, a, a very uh, uh, unusual engineering uh, advancement here um, that is uh, unique to the uh, Shure uh, 2.4 gigahertz system. So uh, if you're looking at GLXD, three, maybe four systems of standard uh, GLXD are, are usually possible. But any more than that, uh, you'd have to use something like GLXD Advanced or add other frequencies or add systems in other frequency ranges. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, kind of the heart of uh, uh, the way the GLXD Advanced works. All right. So let's look at uh, another frequency band with yet another set of hardware. Uh, this is uh, the so-called Shure Microflex wireless system. Now, the Microflex wireless system operates uh, in what's called the DECT band, D-E-C-T, uh, for what, uh, Digital Enhanced Cordless Telecommunications. Uh, primarily, the, this is a frequency range that's used by telephone-related things like uh, uh, remote headsets uh, that you can talk to your desk phone while you're wandering around your office, uh, but it's also used by uh, some uh, baby monitors and other uh, unlicensed uh, sort of consumer things. Uh, it's not nearly as widely used as uh, the 2.4 gigahertz range, 
But there's always a possibility of some amount of deck band traffic in a given location that may reduce the total number of these things that you could use at a time. It may also be worth pointing out that the deck band is not universal. There are at least four different decked band, so-called decked band ranges around the world. Uh, North America, uh, the band that we use here is uh, 1920 to 1930 megahertz, a, a 10 megahertz chunk. Uh, in Europe and some other countries, uh, the deck range is uh, 1880 to 1900 megahertz, which is a 20 megahertz range. Uh, and that uh, amount of uh, spectrum available does affect the, the channel count that can be achieved with these systems. Within uh, those ranges, the, the 10 megahertz, range you've you've got basically five carrier frequencies and within the uh, 20 megahertz range you've got uh, 10 carrier frequencies so there are a number of smart technologies that are uh, used in mxw and in fact are are essential uh, to make this thing work um, and one of them of course is the ability to scan that spectrum to determine uh, appropriate uh, channel counts. Uh, and it is not only a uh, frequency hopping system within the channels that are available, it is like GLXD advanced, uh, a time slot uh, controlled system. Uh, so one of the things that uh, you sort of need to look at first uh, when you're setting up a deck band system is, uh, how much deck traffic is there and how does that affect uh, the number of channels that I might be able to put on the air? Uh, this is a, a slide that shows the result of a scan, but I think I may be able to do one live here. If I go here, this is a, a live view of an MXW rig that's set up here. Uh, and you can see there's two active transmitters here, uh, but there is a uh, spot on the left here, uh, spectrum scanner. And this is something that is a, a necessary uh, function when you're uh, evaluating uh, how many channels of one of these MXW systems could be installed at a particular location. So if we click the spectrum uh, scanner button here, it brings up a window. Uh, and if I click start scan, I'll get a little message that says, oh, I'm gonna turn off all the transmitters, yep. And now it turns the uh, access point, uh, which is kind of the heart of the system, into a decked band scanner. Uh, so you've got these two pie charts. The one on the top is uh, the instantaneous amount of decked traffic that's going on. Uh, the one on the bottom is a long-term average. You can run these scans for up to 24 hours or so. Uh, and this is a, a highly recommended uh, task to perform before you specify a system like this in some location. Uh, as we can see here, the decked traffic uh, is pretty benign. Uh, if if Pac-Man is mostly green, that's good. Uh, the red bits are high traffic, the yellow bits are moderate traffic, uh, but based on the scan, there are two tables here, uh, one for so-called uh, um, uh, standard density mode and the other for high density mode, and I'll explain in a second, but in standard density mode, uh, with this amount of traffic, uh, conservatively, we expect we could put up uh, 28 to 30 channels in this location, and, and we'd have enough spectrum to run that. Uh, if you're willing to sacrifice a little bit of robustness, uh, maybe we could run up to 36 channels here. The, the maximum uh, in uh, standard mode is 40 uh, channels. Um, in so-called high density mode, which uh, cuts the occupied bandwidth uh, in half, and uh, play some other tricks with modulation, you can effectively double that channel count. Uh, but the RF uh, performance is not quite as robust as in the standard mode. And then in the long, based on the long-term average, uh, we get similar numbers down here. So uh, 
this is a useful thing to do ahead of time if you're looking at a deck band system. So we'll stop that scan uh, and uh, close that window. Uh, the transmitters are turned off now. I would have to go back and reactivate them uh, if I, and I can do that either by uh, hitting the power switch on the transmitter or uh, putting it back in the uh, uh, charger to uh, reactivate it. All right, let me return to PowerPoint land here. Okay. So uh, this is uh, kind of what's going on in terms of the uh, overall uh, spectrum of the deck band. Now, how the system handles this uh, is uh, interesting. Uh, what we see here is a grid that shows the five frequencies and they're divided up into 24 uh, time slots. Uh, a, uh, a frame uh, is uh, 24 time slots. Uh, and each of those uh, time slots is about uh, 417 microseconds. The, the frame is 10 milliseconds total. Uh, and these devices can make use of any combination of frequencies and time slots to generate a, a continuous uh, audio transmission. When the system is first turned on or you uh, pull a microphone out of a, a charger, it doesn't know anything about uh, its uh, frequency or what time slots it's running on. All it knows is what uh, access point channel it's linked to. Uh, but the access point it can uh, pick up uh, signals from up to eight uh, transmitters at a time. And it uh, essentially controls the synchronization of all of the linked transmitters. So it knows which time slots they're using uh, and which uh, frequencies they're using within the uh, total that's available for that. Uh, and the, uh, the colors in this uh, chart here, uh, yellow or red or kind of orangish, kind of uh, are measuring the uh, noise uh, or possibly the presence of a signal in any of those uh, time slots uh, or frequencies. And the access point is what makes the determination on which uh, frequencies and time slots uh, to assign. Um, so in case of what uh, is a kind of a North American system here, we see five frequencies with their various time slots. Uh, in the uh, European uh, scheme, you'd see uh, 10 uh, frequencies with uh, 24 time slots. Uh, so these are the available uh, chunks that the system can use to uh, assign to different transmitters to get uh, continuous uh, transmission of signals. Uh, so the transmitter starts off knowing nothing, but after it handshakes with the uh, access point, it knows what uh, time slots and frequencies uh, that it's supposed to use. So this looks fairly straightforward uh, for a single access point. Uh, with some number of, of transmitters. Uh, and there's really no uh, user input required uh, at this stage. Uh, I've linked up some transmitters to an access point, pull them out of the charger. They pick up appropriate frequencies and time slots from the access point and away they go. But uh, what uh, may happen if we have multiple access points running uh, at the same time? Uh, the access points are not synchronized with each other. Their clocks are not uh, synchronized. Uh, transmissions of uh, that are being dealt with on one access point may be occurring uh, at the same time or overlapping transmissions from uh, the other access point. Uh, with only two access points on the air, the ability of the frequency hopping and time slot hopping is sufficient that although one access point sees all the other stuff from the second access point, access point as a bunch of interfering signals, it can usually negotiate those interfering signals and maintain uh, continuous transmission. So 
couple of access points operating simultaneously, you can generally uh, operate them without having them uh, aware of each other. But as you increase uh, the number of access points, you want to get from eight channels to 30 channels or something like that, uh, we need to uh, be more efficient in this because uh, instead of having each system look like a huge interfering source to the others, uh, we'd like each system to be aware of the others and they can all coordinate together. So if we look um, at uh, uh, the uh, next slide here, uh, now we're looking at uh, three access points uh, and it's possible that a transmission and one access point can affect uh, any of those things. Uh, and this gets to be unmanageable when you get uh, probably more than about three access points going at the same time. Uh, so when these systems are connected together, uh, the requirement is that each access point be on the same network with the other access points. And if they're networked together, the access points become aware of each other and so the frequency and time divisions that are applied to all of the transmitters in that rig are coordinated together. So uh, every transmitter uh, on every frequency and time slot is managed uh, in conjunction with all of the transmitters. So this becomes much more efficient. Uh, the devices are not appearing as interference to each other. And so you can get uh, a much uh, better use of spectrum uh, with more reliable operation. Uh, and there's just one other point here. It is the case that the MXW uh, transceivers, the, the things we call transmitters are actually also receivers and the access point, which we think of as receivers actually also a transmitter like uh, uh, GLXD in that sense. Uh, but, uh, MXW does have uh, diversity uh, transmitters and receivers. There's multiple uh, little antennas in the uh, transmitters of these things um, to uh, minimize uh, multipath issues. Um, and uh, it's relatively uh, efficient to do this because at that uh, frequency range, the wavelength is very small. So the antennas can be uh, inside the devices, you can put a couple of them in there with the appropriate circuitry and get a diversity performance uh, at either end of, of the link. Uh, so that's how the MXW system handles its uh, radio end in, a, uh, in an efficient uh, and intelligent fashion. Um, and it's worth uh, repeating that this system also incorporates uh, AES-256 encryption on the signal itself, so it can't really be uh, intercepted or received by unintended uh, receivers. All right, let's look at uh, uh, some aspects of uh, our UHF systems. Uh, one thing to note here is that uh, digital systems have an advantage in terms of uh, the carrier to noise ratio uh, in how that signal hangs in there uh, in the presence of interference or other things. Uh, as analog uh, FM signals lose uh, signal noise ratio, the signal becomes uh, noisy perhaps and eventually mutes. Digital signals, uh, those can hang in there uh, for uh, very low carrier to noise, uh, carrier to, uh, noise ratios. Uh, and only uh, near the end, you might get some uh, interference effects and then it mutes, but typically at a lower uh, received signal strength than you get uh, from uh, an analog system. So the digital systems uh, to some extent can operate in much less favorable signal to noise, uh, RF signal to noise environments than uh, traditional analog systems. Uh, the other uh, capability that these uh, digital systems like ULXD and Axiom Digital have is so-called high density mode. Uh, in this mode, uh, the uh, occupied bandwidth of the transmitted signal is cut in half. It's reduced from about 200 kilohertz to 125 kilohertz. Uh, we reduce the power to uh, a milliwatt or two milliwatts, depending on the system. And this allows uh, at least a doubling of 
uh, active uh, frequencies uh, in a given amount of spectrum. So if you need very, very high channel counts uh, and the RF environment is modestly uh, benign, you can achieve that with high density mode uh, in ULXD and Axiom Digital. Uh, so this is a, uh, a useful feature and, and unique uh, to uh, sure in terms of some smart engineering on these systems. All right. Uh, in the AD and even in uh, ULXD, uh, interference detection plays a, a powerful role here. Uh, in Axiom Digital, uh, you can use the interference uh, alerts and interference warnings detection to uh, put up alerts in uh, wireless workbench, for example, or to actually cause the system to take action, like change to a different frequency if necessary. Uh, one of the things uh, to recall is that uh, the Axiom Digital receivers are uh, two receiver sections per channel. Uh, so they're running two bit streams from each uh, uh, antenna, basically. Uh, but if interference is detected, you'll get either an interference alert which means a mild level of interference, or if it uh, lights up and says interference with a big exclamation point, that's uh, an interference detection that is likely to disrupt uh, the audio. Uh, these warnings appear on the receivers, they appear in wireless workbench, uh, and it may be worthwhile for the engineer to take action uh, when these uh, interference alerts come up. To illustrate uh, one of the capabilities of the interference management. Uh, in Axiom Digital, we have the ability to uh, keep track of all of the frequencies uh, of systems that are connected, and also to manage uh, backup frequencies, spare channels that can be deployed if some of the active channels uh, get uh, sufficient levels of interference. Uh, it's accomplished with two additional pieces of hardware. One is the XT600 Spectrum Manager, which can act as a, a scanner and also uh, an interference uh, management device to uh, uh, evaluate and deploy backup frequencies as needed. Uh, and the uh, access point uh, in Axiom Digital is a 2.4 gigahertz device that actually allows the receivers to talk to the transmitters. So again, a two-way communication link is established between the transmitters and receivers uh, with the uh, use of the show link uh, device uh, and specifically with the ADX transmitters. The transmitters have the X in the title uh, are, are able to take advantage of this uh, uh, back channel uh, communication. Uh, if this uh, show link uh, is a 2.4 gigahertz uh, system, it, although it operates uh, on a Zigbee protocol rather than Wi Fi, uh, and as such, it is not uh, strongly affected by even high levels of Wi-Fi traffic uh, in an area. So the show link uh, system is, is quite robust even in the presence of uh, Wi-Fi. Note there's no audio passing through show link. Uh, it's just a back channel communication to the transmitters and certain telemetry from the transmitters like uh, uh, battery level and so forth and some other uh, control applications like uh, talk switches. Uh, but this uh, is what you would see on a uh, receiver that is part of a show link network. Uh, when interference is detected, uh, you can ignore it or you can cause the uh, receiver to uh, perhaps pick up a new frequency from the spectrum manager if there's uh, a clean uh, spare frequency available. And we might have a little demonstration of that in a moment. Um, but let's look at, uh, uh, well, let's look at that. Let me see if I can get there. So I go to Wireless Workbench, and uh, I've got a rack full of gear here. And uh, I'm going to turn on uh, an ADX1M transmitter, the little micro body pack thing. So you can see that guy running. And it's running on a frequency of 484.275. Uh, and if I look quickly at the frequency list, uh, these 
frequencies in the frequency manager, the spectrum manager, are backup frequencies. There's three of them available for this uh, G57 Plus device that I'm running, and another one available for a different receiver. Uh, so if I have an interfering signal source on or near that frequency and I turn it on, uh, this is presently set in auto mode. So if I turn on that uh, interfering source, I get a little alert here that something happened. And notice the frequency of this system just changed from 484.250 to 614.900. That process took about a tenth of a second. Uh, and so very, very minimal interruption of audio that might occur there. But the uh, receiver has said, I'm in trouble. Send me a new one. The spectrum manager says, here you go. And it changes the receiver and the transmitter simultaneously through show link. I go back to the frequency list. I can now see that this frequency 484.275 is seriously degraded because this interfering transmitter is still on. So if I turn that off, uh, eventually the ranking here uh, after a certain amount of time will go back to yellow and then maybe green. Uh, it's essentially in the penalty box for uh, a couple of minutes because it detected uh, some interference on that frequency. So the spectrum manager is constantly monitoring uh, these frequencies. Uh, and if it uh, detect sufficient interference, it will not deploy <clears throat> that frequency. Now this one has recovered long enough that it's ready to be deployed again. But if I turn on this transmitter again, uh, I'm gonna get the red dot saying, oh no, we can't use that. Uh, it's a very strong signal here. Uh, so uh, this is the spectrum manager at work, monitoring the backup frequencies and deploying them as needed. And again, this is a bit of smart technology that is totally unique to uh, sure, uh, specifically the ADX uh, implementation. Uh, so let's go back to here. Uh, again, this is what we might see uh, if there was an interference uh, on the front panel of the receiver. Uh, frequency diversity is another possibility here. A single handheld transmitter can transmit on two different radio frequencies simultaneously. Uh, and if a problem occurs at either side, the system continues uninterrupted on the uh, frequency that's unaffected. Uh, and at the same time, if the spectrum manager is available with some spare frequencies, those degraded frequencies will quickly be replaced by uh, fresh frequencies. So combination of frequency diversity on one of these handhelds or with two body packs, uh, you can get a very, very robust uh, performance out of these systems, uh, almost unkillable uh, with uh, interference events. Okay. Uh, one other aspect of the AD receivers is uh, uh, something called quadversity. Again, a, a kind of unique feature. Uh, this allows a second set of antennas to be connected to a single uh, receiver operating quadversity mode. This would allow you to cover two different areas, perhaps, uh, with uh, two different pairs of antennas and not have to worry about combining those antennas uh, they feed separate uh, sections of the receivers. Um, or uh, you can cover a very large area or oddly shaped area with multiple antennas. The advantage of this uh, compared to combining antennas is that uh, each antenna is operating independently, uh, connected to its own receiver section. In quadversity mode, uh, two channels of the receiver are combined, and because each channel has two receiver sections. I'm now looking at four receiver sections feeding one audio channel. And I, that means I have four independent bit streams to uh, put together to create a continuous audio bit stream for that channel. This makes the performance very, very robust, uh, even in uh, large areas or multiple areas, uh, because I now have uh, four independent bit streams uh, producing the audio output. It's expensive, yes cuts your receiver channel count in half. But uh, if you're really interested in something that you'd call uh, a money channel, uh, this would be uh, a way to do it. Okay. And uh, there's uh, just a, a couple of notes here on wireless workbench. Um, this is the program we just saw a bit of it there. 
uh, provides a method of uh, coordinating frequencies, uh, not just for sure systems, but any manufacturer's products. You can manage networked sure systems within uh, wireless workbench uh, and, uh, uh, and control them uh, remotely. Um, if we look, actually, it's better to look at the thing itself. So if I go back to Workbench and go to the uh, frequency coordination page. So this, this is a scan uh, that I did this morning from here in downtown Chicago. Uh, all of these red vertical bars are active TD channels, which you can see these DTD uh, channel signals. And uh, the only place I can put things uh, presently here is down in TV channel 16 and uh, up in this little bit of TV 38 in the G57 plus band. Uh, my backup frequencies happen to be up here, but these blue bars indicate the span of the different uh, devices that are attached. So I've got some gear in the G50 band, some in G57, some in G57 plus. Uh, and I've got a limited spectrum here in Chicago, but I can put up pretty large numbers of these digital systems because of their very high uh, spectral efficiency. So this is the screen that you'd use to calculate frequencies. Uh, the inventory shows up over here and all of this stuff is online, uh, but you can add equipment that is not online from either Shure or other manufacturers as well. Uh, the monitor tab is what we saw earlier. I can kind of keep track of what's going on uh, with the particular transmitters uh, or receivers that are attached to this. Okay. Um, and uh, da, da, da. so that's the, uh, the monitor tab. We looked at that already. Uh, there's one other uh, thing that runs on the workbench, which is called the timeline. And if we're looking at the timeline, uh, this is a, uh, a part of the program that actually can look at the continuous uh, performance of all of the channels that are on here. Uh, signal, in this case, this is one of the AD uh, systems that's on right now. Uh, signal quality, the RF uh, levels at the antennas, the show link levels, that's the back channel communication, uh, battery levels, uh, audio levels, and so forth are all monitored continuously, uh, which is useful for setup and also potentially for uh, troubleshooting purposes. So this timeline feature is another bit of intelligence uh, or smarts that we've added uh, on the software side of things to manage these systems even uh, during actual uh, operation. Okay, so let's go back to here. And the last bit of uh, intelligence or smart stuff that Sure has added here is uh, Sure Plus Channels. And this is a an app that can run on iOS devices that allows you to monitor and to some extent control our networked uh, wireless systems. This would be ULXD, QLXD, St. Digital. You can effectively see what the front panels of the receivers are doing, and you can actually make changes on these things uh, through this app. Uh, that is the bulk of the presentation material, I think. Carol, are you still there? I am still here, and we've got. Have I gone sufficiently far over the limit here? Oh yes, yes, you definitely have. Um, but we have quite a few questions, so we'll try and oh get, get through these pretty quickly. Um, very first question off the top: Is encryption available for PSM one thousand IEM transmitters? It is not. Those systems are uh, analog transmission systems, uh, and there's not really a convenient way to uh, implement encryption schemes with analog wireless systems. Okay. Next question. For encryption, can you have two or more sure receivers all decrypting a transmitter signal, or is a transmitter uniquely paired to a single rece receiver? I know there aren't many use cases for this. Just curious if someone with a sure receiver could also receive signal. Ah, uh, um, it is possible to pair multiple transmitters with a receiver, but it is not possible to pair a transmitter with multiple receivers, it, with encryption, that is. Gotcha. Uh, without encryption, yes, anything can receive anything, but encryption uh, would allow you to have multiple transmitters encrypted to the same receiver channel, 
but not uh, a single transmitter encrypted to multiple received channels. Okay. Next question. When using the wireless workbench software, sometimes the recommended auto search frequencies are somewhat noisy compared to others that are available. Do you recommend that we use the recommended frequencies? We use QLXD in the H50 and G50 bands. Okay. By, by recommended, do we mean recommended from... From the auto like our search. online frequency sure. finder? No, it says uh, sometimes the recommended oh. auto search frequencies. Gotcha. So uh, I can answer that by pointing to uh, to this. Hang on. Um, so um, if you look at a scan like this, uh, this lower red line here is the... Uh, Exclude so-called exclusion thresholds about minus 85 dB uh, M, which is usually about the lowest LED on the LED uh, RF meters on our receivers. With these settings, the program is happy to recommend any frequency that is below that red line. Uh, but you might say, uh, of course, that the noise floor up here is somewhat lower than the noise floor here and it's certainly lower than the noise floor in here so uh, the program will give you uh, a frequency that is uh, clean enough um, and uh, the scan within the receiver uh, does a similar thing but it doesn't really look at the whole picture it sweeps through its frequency range oh here's a frequency that's quiet enough to use we'll go there but it really doesn't uh, go to the extent of picking the very, very quietest frequency. It picks whichever one satisfies the uh, whatever the threshold is, and here we are. So having a visual into the spectrum can give you a, a little bit more insight uh, into where you might want to put uh, frequencies. Okay. Uh, next question. How does the transmitter and receiver maintain digital stink? excuse me, digital sync for the bit streams? Ah, that's a good question. The, uh, the clocking information is encoded into the bit stream itself. So there's not a separate um, clock signal that uh, comes along. Uh, the, the clock information is encoded into the bit stream itself. And yes, there is a slight handshaking when you fire up a transmitter says, okay, what, what, where am I here? Oh, okay, now I'm locked. Let's go. So, uh, but the clocking information is, is actually part of the bit stream that's being transmitted. All right. Next question. Um, if the signal is too loud and there's no pad, uh, parentheses, I couldn't find it in the ADX, ADX1M, uh, ah. there's no way to attenuate the sensitivity other than moving the microphone further away from the sound source? Uh, okay. So it is the case that the ADX1M, the micro pack, does not have a switchable analog pad. Uh, and so that transmitter uh, may be subject to an overload uh, condition on that little buffer amplifier, the analog circuit there that's at the very beginning, if you hit it too hard. I don't have the specs in front of me, but uh, I can imagine a case where uh, you're hitting that transmitter with a very, very hot signal uh, and you're exceeding uh, the headroom on that uh, input buffer stage. And because there's no internal uh, pad for that, your choices are either to reduce the input level, you know, if it's a microphone, uh, don't yell as loud or get farther away from the microphone, uh, or use a transmitter that has that pad in it. I have only encountered this, to be honest, one time uh, so far <laughs> where a, a singer with a headset microphone seemed to, to be able to cause some uh, distortion uh, on an ADX-1 on a particularly enthusiastic utterance. <laughs> um, and so it, it, you'd have to look at the input, uh, uh, maximum input uh, level that that transmitter can uh, withstand, uh, but it isn't as high as the other ones with the switchable pad. All right. Next question. Do you have less bandwidth in the 2.4 gigahertz range as compared to UHF? Excuse me. Yeah, UHF. 
And do you use the same codex as ULXD or Axiant Digital? Ah, uh, uh, bandwidth. Um, I'm not sure if we mean like occupied bandwidth of the radio signal or audio bandwidth. Um, the occupied bandwidth of the radio signal in the UHF spectrum is a maximum of 200 kilohertz as dictated by the FCC. Uh, in the 2.4 gigahertz range, uh, occupied bandwidth is a kind of a variable depending on your uh, duty cycle of the transmission, the power level of the transmission. Um, the occupied bandwidth uh, of our systems within the 2.4 gig band, I think, is uh, a little less than 200 kilohertz, but uh, I, I can't say for sure. Uh, but the latency uh, in the 2.4 gigahertz uh, systems is greater than the latency in our UHF systems. Uh, Axiant Digital, about uh, uh, two milliseconds. Latency, uh, ULXD, QLXD, about 2.9 milliseconds. Uh, GLXD, between four and seven milliseconds, uh, depending on which uh, group you're using. And a lot of that latency is due to the extra processing that has to be done to get that signal uh, into uh, that three frequency time slot arrangement. Uh, it's not something that's under the control of the user, but uh, it does affect the channel count. Okay. Next question. Is the GLXD frequency hopping hopping to a backup only controlled by the trans or excuse, me, excuse me by the receiver or is there an interference receiver in the transmitter unit as well? Uh, the interference detection is actually just in the receiver. Okay. The, the the part we call the receiver with the two <laughs> antennas on it even though it's a, it's te technically a transceiver but yes, the part we call the receiver that's where the interference detection lies. What's the benefit of a system in 2.4 over normal UHF systems? Well, uh, the, the main two benefits that uh, we had mentioned were uh, freedom from license requirements. It's an unlicensed band around the world. Uh, and also, uh, it is not affected by uh, broadcast operations, that is broadcast television or other broadcast services. So from the standpoint of, can I take this to any country and set it up and use it? The short answer is yes. The longer answer is you do need to be aware of the local Wi-Fi environment at your venue. Uh, whereas in UHF systems, uh, the question first is, oh, what country am I going to? Okay, what is the legal part of the UHF band that I can use in that country? Do I need a license for that band? And oh, by the way, are there a bunch of 1 million watt digital TV transmitters in that city uh, that I need to worry about? Uh, so th those are the kind of uh, choice differences, but the determinant in many cases is channel count. If I only need one or two systems, GLXD is probably great. Uh, but if I have to put up more than four or five systems simultaneously, I'm not going to be able to do that reliably in the 2.4 gigahertz range unless I go to the, you know, the trouble of the GLXD advance, for example. Okay, and then continuing on with GLXD, what is the max number of transmitters I can use with multiple frequency managers? Uh, on paper, <laughs> 11. Uh, 11 would be a very benign Wi-Fi environment. And by benign, I mean there's no uh, Wi-Fi access points uh, or wireless routers or Wi-Fi hotspots within probably like a hundred feet of where you are. And not everybody in the audience is uh, live streaming on Wi-Fi on their phones uh, around the stage. Uh, the the 2.4 gigahertz environment is, is, is quite limited in that regard. Uh, and the rule of thumb is Wi-Fi routers 20, 30 feet away from any of your GLXD receivers. We, we get into continuous problems with people who are using digital mixers and they're controlling them with their iPads and they've got a wireless router on the table next to the mixer for their iPads and eight inches away from that wireless router is a stack of GLXD receivers. 
that will not work. You've got to get that router out of there or move the GLXD receivers far away from that thing because that's just a huge 2.4 gigahertz polluter. You can perhaps force the Wi-Fi up into the 5 gig range, which will reduce the congestion in 2.4 gig. But uh, if you're not aware of that, um, that is probably the number one source of problems we have with GLXD equipment is the the uh, proximity of wireless routers to the uh, receivers. Gotcha. All right. Next question. What's the latency in the Microflex systems? Ah, hmm, somebody had to ask that question. <laughs> uh, the latency through the Microflex wireless system is 17 milliseconds, ladies and gentlemen. 17 milliseconds uh, compared to two or three or four or seven milliseconds through our wireless, regular wireless mic systems, 17 milliseconds in Microflex wireless. Uh, it's not a system that we typically recommend for sound reinforcement purposes because uh, a seven, 17 millisecond latency is going to make the speakers sound like they're 17 feet farther away than they really are. Uh, and that that can be noticeable in a in a close proximity where you're near the loudspeakers and you're hearing potentially a little delay of your own voice. Uh, it's mostly used in teleconferencing applications where the latency through the teleconferencing link is, you know, 200 milliseconds, <laughs> and then it's not noticeable. But uh, 17 milliseconds through uh, MXW. So keep that in mind if you're specifying something for live sound reinforcement. That's not where I would go first. All right. Next question. Why didn't GLXD use Zigbee? Uh, it, to, to do its audio transmission on. It's an interesting question. Well, Zigbee, by definition, is a control protocol. It is not a protocol that is used for continuous transmission of uh, information. It is an intermittent a control protocol, which uses narrower channels than you find in uh, in Wi-Fi. And if I go to something here, go down to here, uh, can I get to it from here? No, no, that's not it. Sorry. Uh, Can I find it? Eh. <laughs> uh, I can't remember where the... Ah, there it is, showing plot. Dup, dup, dup. So if I choose my, my AXT610 and start a scan with this thing, uh, th this is the, the access... Uh, the, the show link access point, which is a, a 2.4 gigahertz thing. And I'm using it as a scanner now. So what I'm looking at is the uh, 2.4 gigahertz traffic uh, in the vicinity of this thing. And there's a Wi-Fi router about, I don't know, 15 feet away here. Big honking one. <laughs> um, and you can see the these three areas that are uh, kind of shaded here. Those represent Wi-Fi channels one, five, and uh, 11, which are the so-called orthogonal Wi-Fi channels, the ones that are most used because they're farthest apart from each other, basically. And uh, you can see the traffic kind of building up here over time. And there's, frankly, very little Wi-Fi traffic at this location. Everything I've got here is on hard wire. This white area on the right is uh, representative of the Zigbee channel that the access point is on. If I change to uh, show link channels, these are the Zigbee channels, 11 through 26. Uh, and Wi-Fi in this country does not extend out to these last two Zigbee channels. Uh, if you go back to the, the Wi-Fi channels, channel 13 ends up here. So these last two Zigbee channels are relatively uh, removed from the Wi-Fi area, which is useful because in, in heavy Wi-Fi environments, these are the Zigbee channels that'll get used. Um, but it's not allowed to transmit continuous data 
uh, using the Zigbee protocol. It's that's not what it's uh, set up for. Okay. Next question. That's way more than we wanted to know. <laughs> Next question. Is Sure considering the new Bluetooth 5.2 LE as a wireless mic medium in the 2.4 gigahertz band? The Bluetooth, what was that again? Bluetooth 5.2 LE. Oh, uh, that's a new Bluetooth standard. Um, I mean, I, I can jump in really quick with the kind of yes, please. media relations kind of response to that. Um, we're a private company, so we we don't really discuss what we may or may not be working on in the background. Um, so ultimately, we can't really tell you if we are or not working on that uh, at this point in time. And then I don't know, uh, Tim, if you have any additional insights on that new Bluetooth 5.2. Um, I, I don't. Um uh it perhaps it has a higher throughput or less latency bluetooth has pretty pretty huge latency yeah that's what i was going to say uh, you, you can't uh, bluetooth microphones are not a practical item yeah uh, they're fine for listening because you, you don't know when the music actually started you just know when you started to hear it mm -hmm. uh, it it presently uh the bluetooth uh, standard does not uh, support real time uh audio um, I don't know if future standards are going to be able to do that or not. Um, we certainly have not ever released anything, uh, for, uh, you know, real time audio in the Bluetooth, uh, form. Yeah. We get questions all the time about our Bluetooth uh, listening products and using those for onstage monitoring and you could, but you would be very unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd be about a beat and a half behind the rest of the band. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's fine for connecting to your phone. The connection from one phone to another through uh, cell phone lines, that that uh, latency is, is probably anywhere from 50 to 200 milliseconds. Uh, and so the addition of another you know, 10 or 20 milliseconds from your Bluetooth the connection probably isn't that noticeable, but it, it would be very noticeable if you're trying to do a real-time musical performance. For sure. All right, next question. Uh, describe the connectivity required to allow two MXWAPT8s to communicate with each other. Ah, all you need to do is have them on the same network. Uh, so if, if I was looking at uh, this, and I go to the utility tab here. I only have one access point here. But if I had another access point on the network, it would be configured to be a group two. So if, if, uh, if I go to the configuration tab, each access point gets its own configuration group. So the next access point would be here and here and here. I got to have up to 10 access points. Uh, and if they're on the network, they will be aware of each other and they will communicate uh, to optimize the selection of, of time slots and frequencies for all of the connected uh, transmitters. So no, you, there's no sort of link function. There's no button you push to say, okay, now make this one aware of this one. You, you really just have to put them on the same network. Great. Okay. On AD systems, is the quality meter an indication of CNR, bitstream integrity, or something else? Ah, <laughs> it is an indication of CNR. Yes, that's the carrier to noise ratio. Uh, it's kind of uh, looking at the noise floor close in uh, to the uh, uh, to the on-channel frequency, uh, but it it is also uh, considering um, uh, the the bit error rate. So. Even in the absence of an interfering signal, if you get sufficiently far away that uh, the signal strength kind of drops down close to the noise floor, uh, the quality meter uh, will start to uh, degrade, even though it's not really an on-channel interference per se. Uh, that is where uh, the actually digital kind of really shines uh, particularly if you're in quadversity mode, uh, I have set up demonstrations where I'm running a single transmitter uh, 
to a receiver in quadversity mode and the signal strength on the receivers is unmeasurable. That is, none of the LEDs on the RF meters are lit. The signal is dropping down uh, below minus 90 dBm. And I still get continuous audio out of the thing. Quality meters dropped off a couple of dots, but uh, there's still continuous audio there because the receiver has, in that case, four bit streams to cobble together some usable signal. Uh, it's quite remarkable when you see it. Um, but the, the quality meter, uh, it, it's primarily looking at uh, a degradation of, of RF noise near the carrier frequency, but um, it uh, it also can be affected by a, a bit error rates. Okay. Next question, and I'll I'll start and then I'll kick it off to you. Um, uh, the next question is, is there any timeline for digital IEM systems? So once again, this kind of goes back to the fact that we don't really talk about what we may or may not be working on. Um, but I think maybe, Tim, you can pick it up and talk maybe about latency in digital, digital wireless and um, where that is and how that applies to, to monitoring. Yeah, so um, uh, let me say this about that. Um, the uh, the principle, well, there, the the principal limitation is latency. Uh, musicians are familiar with the effects of latency uh, through in ears and so forth. Uh, up to about uh, five milliseconds, it's generally not too uh, noticeable. When you get up to the <clears throat> five to ten millisecond range, uh, singers will start to hear comb filtering of their own voices if their voice coming back through the inner system is delayed in the sort of five to ten millisecond range. It starts to change the timbre of the voice because you're getting comb filtering. Uh, so any uh, digital in-ear system would want to have uh, a latency as low as possible. Uh, but of course, the overall latency of that return signal is all of the digital uh, things that are in between the microphone and your ear. And that may be a digital microphone, a digital wireless that is, uh, connected to a digital mixing console. And God forbid you've got some wacky plug-in mm -hmm. on the console, it's gonna add another 15 milliseconds. And then that comes back uh, through more latency through a digital in-ear system. When, when that total latency gets up to be you know, in the 10 millisecond range, you're going to get some audible effects, uh, at least with your own voice. So that's been uh, a difficult hurdle. Uh, the other is that uh, these systems must be stereo. And, and a stereo signal doesn't use twice the, the bits of a, a mono signal, but it uses sufficiently more bits uh, to get a, a stereo signal transmitted. And so this uh, capability of low latency, uh, two channel transmission and still keep within the FCC mandated mm -hmm. 200 kilohertz occupied bandwidth is not a simple task. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll offer that within your lifetime, if not mine, mm -hmm. uh, there, there may very well be a digital in-ear offering from sure, but uh, there's certainly uh, nothing that we can talk about at this point. I think it's also interesting to note, however, you know, we're talking about in terms of digital, we're talking more about the transmission side of things. Um, many of our in-ear systems, the PSM 300 um, and uh, certain certain uh, receivers on the PSM 900 and PSM 1000 do actually offer digital audio processing. Um, so they use an analog transmission scheme and then a digital a digital audio signal processor. I'm, am I correct right. about that? So, yeah. yeah. Yes. So our present. 1000s and 900s and the 300s are what you would call a hybrid system. Uh, the audio processing is actually handled in the in the digital domain uh, in all of the receivers for those things and also in the transmitter of the 300. But the transmission signal itself is a standard analog FM signal. Uh, and the DSPs are quite uh, uh, efficient the latency that's added by those DSPs in there is a sub one millisecond. Uh, so 
those are not uh, appreciably adding to the overall latency budget. But in order to get a digital audio transmission, the amount of horsepower that goes into that uh, technique inevitably takes time. All right. Next question, somewhat of an older question. Uh, will a short on the cascade output of a UA844 plus SWB have an impact on the other RF outputs? UA844 SWB, the, oh, the, the fifth output. Uh, no. Um, the uh, output sections of the UA844 are sufficiently isolated uh, that whatever damage you might do to one of them will not be communicated to any of the others. Okay. Next question. Does scanning on an AD610 degrade its ability to concurrently execute other functions over show link? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, it won't work. <laughs> uh, that, that is, uh, if I go back to this thing, am I still doing it? Yeah, it's still going. <laughs> so this, this particular AXT610 will be of no value if I need to change frequencies here. Uh, so when it's in this controlled scanning mode, uh, it's not going to be available for uh, communication purposes with uh, transmitters. So uh, it, it does scanning on its own, on its alternate antenna, to keep track uh, of the... Uh, uh, the environment so it always has a good uh, zigbee channel uh but uh, when i tie it up like this it's like tying up a receiver channel to be a scanner it it can't really uh operate as a receiver at that point so i'd have to either get another ad 600 610 whatever uh and use that for my show link stuff and leave this one for scanning purposes um or just take this out of scan mode okay do MXW access points function as cells for roaming transmitters, or is a transmitter stuck to a paired access Ooh. point? Ooh, good question. Uh, the They do not have the capability of handing off a transmitter from one access point to another. So it is not like a cellular phone operation that can hand off uh, a device from one tower to a next, the next. So, yes, the transmitters in a MXW system are tied uh permanently to uh, whatever access point they're connected to until you link it to some other access point manually okay and then i think this is the last question uh with the 2.4 gigahertz system is it safe so i think the question here i'm going to kind of uh translate it um they're talking about say you know you get it set up and you do your sound check but then people come later about so let's say about 800 people come on and they have their mobile phones switched on and they're using wi-fi um, what sort of effect do you think that would have? Well, if the, the typical Wi-Fi signal that's coming out of a mobile phone is relatively low level. Uh, and so, yes, it, it adds to the overall noise floor in the 2.4 gigahertz range. Um, but we haven't really got um, even anecdotal evidence that... Uh, just a, a sea of cell phones uh, causes a problem for these things. It might mean the difference between being able to run four systems versus three systems if the noise floor goes up sufficiently. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the the real uh, culprit in most uh, cases of uh, GLXD issues is a an unseen or unconsidered uh, Wi-Fi router access point that's uh, close to the receivers. All right, great. I think that just about wraps up all the questions. Um, if, a, if you have a question that somehow we missed or that pops into your head, um, you can always open up a ticket with our support team at shore.com slash contact. Um, we got a lot of great and very smart guys and gals, including Tim on that team that can answer a lot of questions across a lot of different audio topics. So that's shore.com slash contact. We want to thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you learned a little something. I know I always do. And we hope to see you on the next one. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.